Chapter Sixteen of Sylvie and Bruno by Lewis Carroll. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Sixteen A Changed Crocodile. The marvelous, the mysterious had quite passed out of my life for the moment, and the commonplace reigned supreme i turned in the direction of the earl's house as it was now the witching hour of five and i knew i should find them ready for a cup of tea and a quiet chat lady muriel and her father gave me a delightfully warm welcome they were not of the folk we meet in fashionable drawing-rooms who conceal all such feelings as they may chance to possess beneath the impenetrable mask of a conventional placidity the man with the iron mask was no doubt a rarity and a marvel in his own age in modern london no one would turn his head to give him a second look no these were real people when they looked pleased it meant that they were pleased and when lady muriel said with a bright smile i'm very glad to see you again i knew that it was true still i did not venture to disobey the injunctions crazy as i felt them to be of the lovesick young doctor by so much as alluding to his existence and it was only after they had given me full details of a projected picnic to which they invited me that lady muriel exclaimed almost as an afterthought and do if you can bring dr forrester with you i'm sure a day in the country would do him good i'm afraid he studies too much it was on the tip of my tongue to quote the words his only books are woman's looks but i checked myself just in time with something of the feeling of one who has crossed a street and has been all but run over by a passing hansom and i think he has too lonely a life she went on with a gentle earnestness that left no room whatever to suspect a double meaning do get him to come and don't forget the day tuesday week we can drive you over it would be a pity to go by rail there is so much pretty scenery on the road and our open carriage just holds four oh i'll persuade him to come i said with confidence thinking it would take all my powers of persuasion to keep him away the picnic was to take place in ten days and though arthur readily accepted the invitation i brought him nothing that i could say would induce him to call either with me or without me on the earl and his daughter in the meanwhile no he feared to wear out his welcome he said they had seen enough of him for one while and when at last the day for the expedition arrived he was so childishly nervous and uneasy that i thought it best so to arrange our plans that we should go separately to the house my intention being to arrive some time after him so as to give him time to get over a meeting with this object i purposely made a considerable circuit on my way to the hall as we called the earl's house and if i could only manage to lose my way a bit i thought to myself that would suit me capitally in this i succeeded better and sooner than i had ventured to hope for the path through the wood had been made familiar to me by many a solitary stroll in my former visit to elveston and how i could have so suddenly and so entirely lost it even though i was so engrossed in thinking of arthur and his lady-love that i heeded little else was a mystery to me and this open place i said to myself seems to have some memory about it that i cannot distinctly recall surely it is the very spot where i saw those fairy children but i hope there are no snakes about i mused aloud taking my seat on a fallen tree i certainly do not like snakes and i don't suppose bruno likes them either no he doesn't like them said a demure little voice at my side he's not afraid of them you know but he doesn't like them he says they're too waggly words fail me to describe the beauty of the little group couched on a patch of moss on the trunk of the fallen tree that met my eager gaze sylvie reclining with her elbow buried in the moss and her rosy cheek resting in the palm of her hand and bruno stretched at her feet with his head in her lap too waggly was all i could say in so sudden an emergency i'm not particular bruno said carelessly but i do like stray animals best but you like a dog when it wags its tail sylvie interrupted you know you do bruno but there's more of a dog isn't there mr sir 
Bruno appealed to me. Who would like to have a dog if it hadn't got a nothing but a head and a tail? I admitted that a dog of that kind would be uninteresting. There isn't such a dog as that, Sylvie thoughtfully remarked. But there would be, cried Bruno, if the professor shortened it up for us. Shortened it up, I said. That's something new. How does he do it? He's got a curious machine, Sylvie was beginning to explain. A welly curious machine. Bruno broke in, not at all willing to have the story thus taken out of his mouth. And if he puts in something of it at the end, you know, and he turns the handle, and it comes out at the other end, oh, ever so short. As short as short, Sylvie echoed. And one day, when he was an outland, you know, before we came to Fairyland, me and Sylvie took him a big crocodile, and he shortened it up for us. And it did look so funny, and it kept looking round, and saying, Wherever is the rest of me got to? And then its eyes looked unhappy. Not both its eyes, Sylvie interrupted. Course not, said the little fellow. Only the eye that couldn't see wherever the rest of it had got to. But the eye that could see wherever. How short was the crocodile? I asked, as the story was getting a little complicated. Half as short again, as when we caught it. So long, said Bruno, stretching out his arms to their full stretch. I tried to calculate what this would come to, but it was too hard for me. Please make it out for me, dear child, who reads this. "'But you didn't leave the poor thing so short as that, did you?' "'Well, no. Sylvie and me took it back again, and we got it stretched to—to to how much was it, Sylvie?' Two times and a half, and a little bit more,' said Sylvie. "'It wouldn't like that better than the other way, I'm afraid.' "'Oh, but it did, though,' Bruno put in eagerly. "'It was so proud of its new tail. I never saw a crocodile so proud.' Why, it would go round and walk on the top of its tail, and along its back all the way to its head. Not quite all the way, said Sylvie. It couldn't, you know. Ah, oh, but it did once, Bruno cried triumphantly. It weren't looking, but I watched it, and it walked on tippy-toe, so as it wouldn't wake itself, cause it thought it were asleep, and it got both its paws on its tail, and it walked and it walked all the way along the back, and it walked and it walked on its forehead, and it walked a tiny little way down its nose. There now. This was a good deal worse than the last puzzle. Please, dear child, help again. I don't believe no crocodile never walked along its own forehead, Sylvie cried, too much excited by the controversy to limit the number of her negatives. You don't know the reason why it did it. Bruno scornfully retorted. It had a welly good reason. I heard it say, Why shouldn't I walk on my own forehead? So of course it did, you know. If that's a good reason, Bruno, I said, Why shouldn't you get up that tree? Shall we in a minute? Said Bruno. Sooner we've done talking, Only two peoples can't talk comfortably together When one's getting up a tree and the other isn't. It appeared to me that a conversation would scarcely be comfortable while trees were being climbed, even if both the peoples were doing it. But it was evidently dangerous to oppose any theory of Bruno's, so I thought it best to let the question drop, and to ask for an account of the machine that made things longer. This time Bruno was at a loss, and left it to Sylvie. "'It's like a mangle,' she said. "'If things are put in, they get squoze.' Squeezled, Bruno interrupted. Yes. Sylvie accepted the correction, but did not attempt to pronounce the word, which was evidently new to her. They get like that, and they come out, oh, ever so long. Once, Bruno began again. Sylvie and me righted. Wrote, Sylvie whispered. Well, we wrote it a nursery song, and the professor mangled it longer for us. And it were, there was a little man, and he had a little gun, and the bullets. I know the rest, I interrupted. 
but would you say it long i mean the way that it came out of the mangle we'll get the professor to sing it for you said sylvie it would spoil it to say it i would like to meet the professor i said and i would like to take you all with me to see some friends of mine that live near here would you like to come i don't think the professor would like to come said sylvie he's very shy but we like it very much only we'd better not come this size you know the difficulty had occurred to me already and i had felt that perhaps there would be a slight awkwardness in introducing two such tiny friends into society what size will you be i inquired we better come as common children sylvie thoughtfully replied that's the easiest size to manage could you come to-day i said thinking then we could have you at the picnic sylvie considered a little not to-day she replied we haven't got the things ready we'll come on tuesday next if you like and now really bruno you must come and do your lessons obviously wouldn't say really bruno the little fellow pleaded with pouting lips that made him look prettier than ever it always shows there's something horrid coming and i won't kiss you if you're so unkind ah but you have kissed me sylvie exclaimed in merry triumph well then i'll unkiss you and he threw his arms round her neck for this novel but apparently not very painful operation it's very like kissing sylvie remarked as soon as her lips were again free for speech you don't know nothing about it it were just the conquery bruno replied with much severity as he marched away sylvie turned her laughing face to me shall we come on tuesday she said very well i said let it be tuesday next but where is the professor did he come with you to fairyland no said sylvie but he promised he'd come and see us some day he's getting his lecture ready so he has to stay at home at home i said dreamily not feeling quite sure what she had said yes sir his lordship and lady muriel are at home please to walk this way End of chapter sixteen